Well, thank you, JP, for that kind introduction. And um, thank you, Bioneers, for having me back. It is a pleasure to be back. Um, yay. So I wrote Ministry for the Future in uh, 2019. And that is a long time ago, a previous geological era, uh, and a darker time than now, I want to assert. Uh, Trump was still president, and it looked like he might win in 2020, and uh, people were not taking the climate change crisis that Alan T Adam Tews now calls the poly crisis, very appropriately. We're not taking it seriously enough, and there was a feeling of being um, caught in syrup or a frog in a boiling pot. Um, there are sentences in Ministry for the Future that I now find astonishingly uh, dark. Uh, one, the 2030s were zombie years. Now, that's not going to happen, and that I even wrote that sentence I now find shocking. There has been an acceleration. And I've seen it, and I want to describe some lineaments of it to you so that you can perhaps... I've been trying to construct a cognitive map for myself in these uh, rapidly changing times, and I want to share it with you in case it is uh, useful to you also. So social scientists talk about the great acceleration. Since World War II, everything that social scientists measure has accelerated so that all the graphs are hockey stick graphs, not just population or food production or CO2 release to the atmosphere or pollution in the Earth's biosphere, but everything. The great acceleration is a useful way to think of where we are. But within that um, sense of these last 70 years of, of a constant historical acceleration, there are accelerations within the acceleration. When Alvin uh, Toffler wrote Future Sock in 1970, there was a sense that the last five years had created a sense of craziness, which those of you who are my age and older, you remember. It's hard to convey now, except um, we're in another uh, acceleration within the acceleration, so it might be possible for younger people to now imagine what it felt like from uh, 65 to 75 in the last century. Um, since 2020, we've had first and foremost the pandemic, and secondly, um, but also significant, increasing numbers of climate catastrophes, floods and droughts, uh, mostly, but others as well. There's been also um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a land war in Europe, again, hard to believe. Then also, the financial crises, um, not just of 2008 as a kind of precursor, but also 2020 when the pandemic hit was an instantaneous Great Depression that needed some um, quick work in, by, by the central banks to avoid an instant Great Depression. And then now also the AI moment that we're in, somewhat of a scam, somewhat of a reality, hard to unsort since we don't really know what's going on it being proprietarial within businesses that have an enormous impact on us. All of these add up to a feeling of urgency in a kind of new moment. And this is straight out of Gramsci. The old order has fallen apart. The new order has not yet been born. In the interregnum, it feels weird. And we're in that now, I would suggest. So um, because of that feeling, and particularly, I think, the sense of increasing danger. I want, the one more thing I would add to this um, sense of an increasing acceleration is simply this, the news from the IPCCs, the news from climate science. And uh, there's one, I think, important moment in that, which is a paper in Nature from 2009 um, that l listed nine planetary boundaries, living within planetary boundaries. Uh, it's uh, Johan Rockström and Will Steffen. They wrote this paper. It was published in Nature. Six years later, the Paris Agreement was signed. There is a sense now, I think, that's widespread and growing, that these 
planetary limits, planetary boundaries, that if we break them, the danger is extreme of a runaway greenhouse effect to a hothouse Earth that would wreck human civilization outright. Um, and food shortages would be part of it, but every, the stresses at every level would be such that um, it's quite possible that our ability to hold together as a community of eight billion people would be shattered. And a lot of people take that seriously now. And so the list of good things that I'm going to uh, mention to you now that have come about since then, I think, are precisely from an increased sense of danger to the biosphere itself, that we are uh, the danger, that we have to change, that feeling is there, and then actions follow it. So the Paris Agreement of 2015, rather astonishing that all the countries on Earth gathered together and agreed to a work on climate change and to decarbonize as fast as possible and to set up an annual meeting, these COP meetings, to talk it over. And two things about that I want to quickly say about the Paris Agreement. It's a consensus agreement. All of the nations have to sign off on every sentence of the annual statement or it doesn't uh, function. And so it makes it very slow, cautious, but it makes it very compelling and powerful. Every nation has signed on. The other thing I would say about it is within the agreement itself is a promise to themselves, the nations to each other, to improve every year. Each year's agreement has to show a ratcheting up of the promises to do better in one way or another. So in Egypt last year, at the end of last year, it was the loss and damage bank account finally built to compensate nations that are being hammered by climate change first. Oh, one more interesting thing about the Paris Agreement, it's explicit that the rich nations are to do more to help the poor nations. All these are interesting. Another thing, yeah, another thing that has happened since then, and this is also last year, at, in Montreal, the Chinese ran uh, the, the biological, uh, biosphere health, uh, Congress of the Parties, a different treaty system, again, all the nations. Again, it got signed last year to do 30 by 30. 30% 30 of the Earth's surface left to our wild cousins by the year 2030. Well, this is astonishing. And uh, when I read E.O. Wilson's Half Earth 15 years ago or so, I thought, great idea, very utopian. I'll put it into my utopian science fiction, of course. So great, never gonna happen. And here we are with 30 by 30 already on the books as an international agreement. And California has a state program as such. I met Jennifer Norris, the head of it. She tells me California is at 24%. They'll get to 30% 30 by, 30 by 2030. And she says everybody in the movement also talks about 50 by 50, 50% 50 of the land protected by 2050. Again, amazing. And then lastly, this International Ocean Treaty, a different treaty system, and yet also signed on by many nations, especially those with coastlines. Um, uh, uh, and it took 10 years to do it, the same thing for the oceans, 30 by 30. 30% 30 of the oceans left alone, and essentially this means not fished, by the year 2030. And so these are huge. And they are important, and I don't think they would have happened without a, a sense of fear and of danger, unavoidable danger. We can't negotiate our way out of it. We actually have to do things. And so these treaties have come up precisely because of that reason. We're at about 410, it fluctuates through the year, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And because there's path dependency, because there's resistance to this program of decarbonization, we are not decarbonizing as fast as we really need to, to keep to the 1.5C limit that has been declared safe by the scientists involved. Um, so we're gonna have to decarbonize going forward. Uh, probably we'll overshoot, not in people, that's not a, even a thing because of uh, considerations I don't wanna get into, but a carbon overshoot is quite possible and we're gonna have to decarbonize and pull CO2 out of the atmosphere in the years to come uh, to bring ourselves back within the zone of uh, safety and biosphere stability. That's possible. There is mechanical drawdown by way of uh, vacuum cleaners. It's expensive, it's big machines, it would take a lot of them, and yet, and 
Yet it would draw down CO2, so it's being discussed and investigated, and that's one part of the puzzle, because we are in an all-hands-on-deck situation. But on the other hand, uh, reforestation, and uh, you all know about this stuff, so I will not uh, dwell on it too long, but regenerative agriculture is real. Uh, and I I'm amazed. I was intensely worried that it was a kind of a false front, a name without a, t without a real topic behind it, like, for instance, artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> but regenerative agriculture is more real than that. Um, it, there's a, um, about 1% of carbon by weight in the soil in the heavily farmed areas of the Midwest and around the world. We're making food um, and also ethanol by way of uh, intensive agricultural practices that deplete the carbon in the soil. If you bring it back up to 3 or 4% of carbon by weight in the soil for all the ag lands on Earth, you actually draw down as much CO2 as we've put into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution began. So it's an immense bank of possibility. It won't happen that we can do all of it in any one way, but since we need to grow food and we need to decarbonize, when those two get coupled together into a technology, which we're calling regenerative agriculture, then this is powerful and farmers themselves are interested in it because it takes them out from under the shackles of contracts with companies like Monsanto and restores their farms to them. So this is good too. Now, um, all of this is going to cost money, and one aspect of Ministry for the Future that I think has been one reason for the uh, tension that it's gotten, along with being one of the very few descriptions of how we get through this century without a mass extinction event, which people are hungry for that story. So it makes perfect sense, no matter the weirdnesses of that particular novel, people are hungry for that story. And so in that story is a story of finance. We have to pay ourselves for doing the right things rather than the wrong things. The last time I did a keynote at Bioneers up in Marin County, I talked about how we were paying ourselves to do the wrong things and tearing the earth apart and also creating the 1%, et cetera, that that had to change. It does, and it is. And so whether that can work Further and faster, I don't know, but I just want to point out to you that at the monetary level of monetary policy, so this is central banks and that level of finance, there is a network for greening the financial system. And this is um, the 90 of the biggest central banks in the world, including China, the United States, EU, all the big central banks, discussing how to green money at the source by its issuance as fiat money by central banks. Can it first be given to green projects and then enter the general economy. This organization existed when I wrote Ministry for the Future, but I did not know about it. And it is great news that it exists because it needs to be more than an idea in a single novel, and it is. Then also the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, who have been, as I mentioned five years ago, spectacularly bad at what they supposedly do, and have been great for imperialism as a soft power. But they're changing too, because it's younger people and they sense the danger. So the International Monetary Fund has a thing called special drawing rights. What that means is loans that you don't have to pay back for poor countries that are in distress financially. Countries are being kept from a fate of uh, Sudan or Somalia or Venezuela by way of loans from the IMF that they don't have to pay back. And naturally, the IMF don't want certain people to know about this program because it looks like you're helping poor people, which is very unpopular in certain quarters. But it is. So then um, shifting over from the monetary to the fiscal, as they say in that biz, um, that's just legislation. So we have the IRA bill, stupendous achievement, a great thing the biggest climate bill in history, and uh, $380 billion, and 40% of it to go to areas of disadvantaged in America, amazing. And then a lot of it to go to businesses within America, again, amazing. Industrial policy coming back, neoliberalism taking a blow to the head as we realized that neoliberalism was bad for us. So this bill was astonishing, and it is already written in law, it can't be undone. Um, 
then the carbon, the carbon coin that I described in my book is really carbon quantitative easing so that it is what I described at the beginning. And it's a, a program that says that if you draw carbon dioxide down out of the atmosphere, you get paid for it at a certain rate that means that you make money while you do it, backed by the central banks. Well, the carbon coin is, is a thing, and they are calculating now, the, the ecological economists, the climate economists working on this, that about a, a trillion or two trillion of um, money um, generated year by year and paid out for good green work would be enough to see us through. And the, recall that the gross world product is about 75 to 100 trillion dollars per year per year. So this is a lot of money, but it is not uh, outside the bounds of ordinary um, um, fiscal and monetary policy. In short, you can make up that money from scratch, pay it for green work, and not destroy people's faith in money, by which you don't create inflation or deflation. So um, in that larger world economy, if we start pushing in the way that all of these uh, financial and monetary schemes suggest, that are all in play and being discussed, sometimes at the World Bank, sometimes at the Federal Reserve, sometimes within the in the dark and hidden interior hallways of the Pentagon because it's part of national defense, some of them think, inside the Pentagon, you begin to see uh, the possibilities of a program that is mainstream, that is also green. It's, um, uh, I just want to suggest that it's out there because it's still um, submerged and it's still more a plan than a reality, but it is a plan. So, and in fact, I want to finish with this. I mean, I've just described all of these things happening that if they happen, it would be good. It's legitimate to ask, is that real? Are, will these things happen? Because there will be intense resistance to them. Because there will be a lot of shouting and freaking out about it. Um, could, could it really happen in this so-called fractured uh, political landscape that we're in? I want to suggest that some of the fracturing of the landscape, some of it is real and dangerous. So you're going to have to try to get a working political majority of 51% or 55% or 60% to back these things. And it's going to be hard to get those majorities sometimes. And there's going to be losses, disasters, catastrophes that is going to make it look like it's not working. So it'll be like the cross chop that you sometimes see under the Golden Gate between wind and tide and waves and swells from offshore. You get a ferocious cross chop, just a wild water on, going through the Golden Gate. But the question is this, where's the current underneath going? And that's what we have to keep our eyes on as we go forward and stay calm through the cross chop on the surface of the discourse realize that this is it. Yes, it's a, it's a plan only, the good result for out of the mainstream by way of uh, technological and financial means. It still needs to be enacted. And so it's going to be a wicked political battle for the rest of our lives. It's not going away. Um, but I will say that uh, one of the things I learned, to go back to JP's prompt, I went to um, a COP26 in Glasgow. It was astonishing, and what I saw were 40,000 people working for their countries to make an agreement, and the, inside the red zone, which is the organizer, Nigel Topping, invited me into the negotiating sessions themselves, which I didn't understand for a few days, but then I spent all my time inside there, watching the negotiators. Mostly, well, I would say 60% women, young women, in their 30s and 40s, lawyers and diplomats. <laughs> That was where the real work was being done. The actual speeches on stage were the typical mix. Um, and I can't speak much to that, being an old white guy myself. Um, but it, the work was being done to make sentences to make the world better. It was very beautiful. And so there is real work being done. And Nigel, at the end, he said, oh, Stan, you've, you've got the solution here. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I've been saying about the COP process, rah, rah, rah. Greta Thunberg has been saying, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and what you're saying is law, law, law. We change those laws, 
and we keep working to the fight the political battle and win it, and the biosphere is going to come back in health. And so I want to echo what John Warner said so beautifully on the video just before. There's a lot of work to be done in a scary situation, and you have to keep a sense of dread or at least of high danger, but the possibility of a good result is out there. Two, one, zero. Thank you.